bang, 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 right away, to read away, wave file. Um, so this is quite simple to do. So that's why I'm making some machine because it's also easy to do. <laughs> so, but the model they can synthesize a lot of different sounds and have different interactions. Yeah, I so I could. I will do something about it. Yeah. Making a sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a full song? You no, I mean, like, just generate sound for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. Not compose, like, synthesize. Yeah, not just like this. Yeah. 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 yeah, this is what I do. Like, there, there is different things. For example, uh, he is also talking with another kid, also talking for example. Yeah. 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 Of using AI to control synthesizers. So, for example, you have a synthesizer that is generating sound, like a VST you can use, but then you could try to learn an AI to control the synthesizer. So, this is like an intermediate to control something that generates sound. Or, in me, in my case, what I do is it learns directly to generate sound, but it is the synthesizer, and then the human is controlling it, whatever it wants to do. No, that's good to come to the Is it a bar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I also have the power over here on the <coughs> but it's a Gaia, the commander, so it's not like one hour, at least, more than one hour, still Tokyo, totally wet, so for our listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we will make sure that we are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be Juste avant, peut-être que c'est un cas. Oui, oui, oui. Peut-être cinq minutes avant. Oui, oui, oui. Peut-être cinq minutes avant. Oui, voilà. Deux heures. Est-ce que je peux juste tester mon niveau de sécurité Oui, bien sûr, bien sûr. Parce que j'ai essayé de faire avec trois écrans, mais c'est compliqué. Oui. Avec écran, mon écran plus le vidéoprojecteur, c'est un peu compliqué. D'accord. Il faut que je vois si j'arrive à, à faire la zone machine avec, euh, en regardant derrière moi. On voit. Euh, ouais, c'est vrai, il faut que je fasse une recopie en live. Ouais, il faut juste que je check le, le, le setup. Parce qu'en gros, genre, pendant que je fais la présentation, je ne veux pas recopier. Et après, il faut que je switch en recopie. Ah, Ouais, le mode présentation, il est pas mal, je trouve.
Signal, tu sais, minutes, au bout de 20 minutes, on peut le faire. Euh, tu sais, pour essayer de tout de suite de prendre une indication qu'il faut définir. Ou, euh... Tu dis, moi, de quelqu'un pour le continuer. D'accord, ouais. Tu peux pas Tant qu'il n'y a pas. Tant qu'il n'y a pas. Tant qu'il n'y a pas. Stop pour être clair. Mais Dieu. Dieu, 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 Chacun se tranquille, donc vous disiez 10 minutes avant Peut-être ou voir juste 10 minutes avant la fin. Okay. Au bout de 20 minutes, tu sais, au bout de 20 minutes, de donner un signal pour essayer de garder au moins 10 minutes de, de, de discussion potentielle. Ok. Et ton idée, tu peux dire, 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 I put myself last, so, and then the last composer discussion. I thought it was nice, like finish with this kind of uh, you know discussion, you know, overview about the maybe it's a nice first finish presentation. I finish the science talk. I am the last science talk, and then there is one last talk. And then this is sort of more like I think she needs to make an overview. So I thought it was maybe interesting once we have seen every, everything, like after that talk, which is more an overview. I don't know. 
Yeah, it's like we made it for like uh, art, artsy and stuff, and uh, the two sides like, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, to mix. Thank you. 
On va commencer. C'est le deux minutes à voir. えっと、始めたいと思います。あの、あの、英語でえっと、プレゼンテーションがありますので、全員えっと、よろしくお願いします。あの、so <coughs> This year, the um, Adorian Milkham uh, uh, organized this conference. So thank you uh, for the organization, first of all. And also, the, uh, thank you for coming uh, to the workshop. Um, um, so, the, um, uh, does everyone have already uh, the program for today? If not, then uh, there is one over there. Um, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we try to keep um, on schedule um, as much as possible. <laughs> we cannot guarantee, but uh, we'll try. Um, so the, um, but um, if you have uh, any question uh, during workshop, we try to find, uh, have um, um, last five minutes for the um, uh, maybe discussion, maybe five or ten minutes, let's say. Uh, but uh, at the end of the uh, seminar, uh, you are very much also be welcome to, to discuss with us. So the. Um, we usually go to the um, izakaya. <laughs> we don't say bar in this area because it's very popular area. Uh, as you know, it's other area is quite <laughs> special area in Tokyo, I would say. So the, um, we are going out at the end uh, in order to discuss. I mean, um, so if you like, uh, you're very much welcome. If you could come with us. And also, the, um, uh, just for the um, 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 uh, show the information, uh, on um, 19th of February, um, we are having the concert, which is composed uh, with uh, AI or some other technique. So the, um, it's going to be here. So the, uh, let's say um, we have some information, and if you like to also absorb the artistic side, you're very much welcome to uh, participate in this concert. Um, so I'm the first one, so I just go ahead to talk about my presentation. Um, so I'm closing this now. This is, this is um, okay. Now, uh, this is um, my presentation. I'm going to talk about the proposition, proposition of application of multi agent for the composition. Um, having said that, um, I had a um, uh, composition uh, last year uh, with the um, deep learning. And then um, with this um, consequence, um, I had some idea of merge agent, uh, particularly. So um, this time, it's not something like a very, um, the, the, the result of the research. I would say that's a proposition. So that, that's, that's why I'm saying the proposition this way. Um, so the uh, briefly uh, the, the the context of this idea is that um, we have research um, the theme uh, AI and composition last year, uh, and then um, especially we focus on the idea of how um, deep learning can apply to the musical composition. Um, in fact, we are not um, the um, technical uh, institution; we are uh, at uh, school. So the one we can contribute uh, in this field is rather the proportion of artistic side, how uh, AI can be, uh, be applied for the uh, uh, musical composition, and what is the uh, progress of music, and uh, meaning of progress of music with this. So the, uh, what I'm going to talk is also, it's not the um, uh, 
technical side, but it's, uh, it's uh, dedicated for the, um, the, the musical side. Um, so the, uh, what is um, AI in composition for us? Uh, we go, uh, focus on the composition with AI, but uh, in this case, it is um, notated uh, music. Instead of having the, um, um, the computer on stage, some sort of interaction between the um, um, human performer and uh, AI, but uh, we um, focus on the idea of the composition, how this can be uh, used for the development of uh, especially contemporary music. We look for the uh, new idea. Um, so the, instead of uh, focusing on the um, technical uh, development, uh, we uh, really uh, um, thought about how uh, we can go beyond the traditional algorithmic composition. Um, for us, it's, it means a lot, algorithmic composition. Um, in, in the computer music field, uh, it has been already uh, established, algorithmic composition, but uh, if we use AI, what we can do with this uh, means that the, um, uh, instead of having the idea of traditional al algorithmic composition, um, the main purpose is to achieve the progress of music and art uh, with the application of AI. Um, <clears throat> when we say the composition, but uh, we usually uh, mean that the composition is uh, um, compose, uh, compose music. But uh, there is a sort of contradiction that uh, AI is replaced to compose, as a matter of fact. It's not really composer to compose. But the, um, uh, uh, um, um, the, uh, what AI can only do uh, if uh, AI is replaced uh, instead of the um, human uh, composer, but all, uh, and then uh, what um, human cannot do. So the um, uh, very uh, simple question, uh, uh, what, or the, the, the idea that the, um, the um, let's say uh, we, if we um, have uh, different type of composer, different type means that different kind of capability or different kind of a musical style, and then um, two different composers uh, exist at the same time you know, in order to compose one single piece. So the one has certain advantage and a disadvantage, and the other uh, can oppose what uh, he composed. What I did specifically uh, is that uh, one um, uh, 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 AI generate complex music data with constraint programming, and the other, uh, the other one is um, uh, sort of um, different type of uh, composer, like um, he filters the disadvantage of parts while um, recognizing musical patterns and so on. So, um, <clears throat> um, uh, in specifically, uh, um, uh, uh, one um, side of the composer uh, generated uh, the musical materials with a genetic algorithm. Um, well, uh, maybe um, I don't have to explain what a genetic algorithm uh, for today, but um, what, I, what I did is, uh, first of all, with a genetic algorithm, uh, uh, with open music, uh, which is specifically a Darwin, and the, um, this is, uh, when I said uh, materials, uh, music element is not longer duration, uh, it's uh, um, shorter duration, such as um, one second to uh, maximum uh, 10 seconds. And the, um, I am um, sort of the, uh, hope I prepare uh, the ide idealistic uh, um, materials, and then um, uh, I did uh, evaluate many, many generations. In fact, it took a huge amount of time to generate um, very short uh, materials. But uh, this is the one of this uh, one side of composer who did. And the other one is, is constraint programming. This is quite um, uh, um, um, sophisticated and easy to generate materials. But um, open music, there is already exist uh, like um, LZ, OMRC and situation 
I don't get into the um, this this uh, library of open music, but um, one thing I can emphasize is DYCI2. So the, there is um, a, a library for the Max and also the open music, which uh, is developed at IFCAM, um, as you know, the general income uh, who uh, did uh, this library. Um, this is the um, the interface of the DYCY2, the and also the version of open music um, one has to use of music seven. Um, I didn't use it for this in this composition, but there's also some others on uh, uh, of uh, music seven X seven. And as you know, the OMAX uh, in Protect is the um, uh, sort of the good example of machine learning. Um, specifically, what I did is the um, with um, such a constant volume and also the uh, general person, I created uh, materials. And uh, from materials, I derived the structure and then at the end is form. Um, this is sort of the method of composition of the uh, new music. And the, at this point, I didn't uh, go beyond, but I'm talking about the process of the composition. So the, I followed the pretty much the, um, the usual uh, contemporary music style. But uh, the important thing is, I generate short example, but in order to generate the structure, uh, I use the, uh, um, 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 the uh, um, um, sort of the technique of uh, remix with AI. The mix means that um, I have to also explain about this point. Uh, um, the uh, what we look for is to, to create a sort of new style of composition. Uh, it's not something like to to, to, to imitate what already exists. Um, we saw many many libraries, and most of them are sort of uh, let's say. Um, you learn, I mean, you give a lot of the uh, style of, um, as, or let's say an example of composition. Like um, uh, you give the example of the Chopin, and let's say um, 100 or maybe 1,000 of the composition of Chopin, and uh, the AI imitates what already exists. That's not quite what uh, we look for. Um, we simply focus on the um, how uh, this can be derived a new type of composition. That's the idea. So the, uh, we generate uh, the uh, materials, and then uh, um, in order to uh, 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 construct sort of the uh, structure, uh, we use sort of the technique of the arrangement. Uh, that uh, arrangement means that um, the combination of material can uh, create sort of structure, which is the uh, relatively um, uh, uh, middle uh, duration. It's not long duration. It's not short duration. So the uh, what we look for at this point is sort of unexpected combination. Uh, sometimes uh, we say uh, that's cool sound. <laughs> what is cool sound? Uh, it, uh, means that the um, something like uh, unexpected combination, but it works well on the musical context. So the uh, unexpected uh, combination uh, with um, uh, something like the uh, idea of the arrangement, but composer does not choose this combination. We expect something else, which is AI. And then um, as, uh, uh, we, um, uh, we choose one of the possibility with many, many examples. In fact, uh, this process also the um, quite time and consuming process. Um, we have to find um, um, uh, uh, many, many examples to work out uh, the best example. And then um, at the same time, uh, I mean, uh, the next process is the uh, form structure, and then we drive the form. But form means that the uh, quite longer duration. So let's say composition is 30 minutes. And then uh, the form is something like, let's say, A, B, C, or A, B, A, or something like this. So first five minutes, or the next um, uh, five minutes, and so on. So these points also, we expect that the um, something like unexpected uh, combination with DYC by 2 So the composer is not really composed. 
composer, uh, only choose what um, the, uh, different kind of com possibility of combinations. This is the specific way that the um, um, audio file is converted with audio stuff uh, of the music. And then um, um, it's uh, at the end, uh, the, this data is, um, uh, I mean, in the middle process, uh, as I said, I think deep learning is currently utilized. But the, um, at the end, uh, it's um, uh, it's uh, reflected as a musical score. Um, this is a little bit different subject, uh, but the um, uh, the musical data cannot be expressed uh, musical score uh, quite easily. Uh, most of the composer has the uh, same problems, but um, um, it's quite um, primitive uh, to, to, to express. I mean, the software is quite primitive to, to understand musical context. Also. <coughs> so I'm also proposing um, some of you who are interested in this subject. Um, I think musical notation software is applied to the uh, AI. This is quite successful, <laughs> but maybe it's some, something um, for the, uh, as an occasion. Um, so the, um, uh, this is a detailed process, but uh, um, uh, uh, OEM diving, uh, 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 the, um, the materials of OEM, uh, OEM diving uh, can be read uh, in the uh, device UI2. And then um, um, uh, 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 this process, the, uh, the choice of Q and also the level, uh, how um, I can generate uh, this Q. Is quite important. It's almost like a um, process of composition. Uh, this level can be uh, generated manually, but uh, also the, it can be uh, done uh, automatically. Uh, and also within device uh, UI2, it can be also done. Um, the, uh, as um, it uh, created more advanced materials, it can be super important and so on. So I jump to the, uh, the result of the composition. It's a little bit too small to see this for. Uh, but the, um, this work is the um, uh, 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 recorder and uh, also the uh, uh, string quartet. Um, I will play uh, the, in the beginning of this composition. This was uh, performed uh, last year. I need to talk, but the uh, um, it's me who conduct uh, this piece, uh, this performance. Usually, for this kind of short, um, a smaller ensemble, uh, uh, there is no conductor. 
but uh, in this case, um, it was quite impossible uh, to perform with that conductor uh, for the prayers. Um, there's um, already certain um, practice or certain uh, uh, way uh, that musical material can be generated. But in this case, it's not a um, uh, um, human uh, composer, but it's uh, actually a computer simply decided for this composition. And for the prayer, it is quite um, unusual uh, musical material, so that they, um, they are not um, uh, quite um, uh, um, uh, comfortable to, to pray. And then also the something only unexpected comes next and so on. So the, um, it, uh, they find it almost impossible to perform this. So the, uh, but uh, with um, indication of the conductor, they really managed uh, to perform this. So the, um, it's quite uh, already, uh, with, even with um, conductor, it's quite difficult to perform this piece as a matter of fact. Um, so the, from, uh, from now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically uh, proposing the idea that I said two brains exist uh, with this composition, uh, something like this. So the, um, um, there's uh, two complex, or uh, one uh, generate music material, but the uh, other is filter, and then uh, with consequence of this filter, the other uh, do uh, like uh, uh, opponent way. So, um, now um, I'm thinking that if this can, uh, this process can be done uh, automatically. So far, uh, I did uh, manually. Uh, it took um, a lot of time, but let's say if one composer and the other can uh, mutually uh, influence or maybe interact with each other, would it be possible? So I look for many many examples. Um, one of the example. I'm interested, but I didn't really find that that's a solution. But one of the thing is the um, uh, with Open AI uh, recently, uh, the uh, the Seek, much agent Hyam Seek is uh, uh, published. So uh, I'll briefly show what is the um, much agent Hyam Seek. On Earth, the simple rules of natural selection and competition led to the evolution of increasingly intelligent life forms. Today, we ask if comparably simple rules and multi-agent competition can also lead to intelligent behavior in a new virtual world. These agents are playing hide-and-seek. These agents have just begun learning, but they've already learned to chase and run away. This is a hard world for a hider who has only learned to flee. However, after training in millions of rounds of hide-and-seek, the hiders find a solution. The hiders learn to use rudimentary tools to their advantage by grabbing and locking these blocks they can create their own shelter. The seekers are locked in place for a brief period at the start of the game, giving hiders a chance to prepare. Even so, the hiders must learn to collaborate, accomplishing tasks that would be impossible for any single individual. The hiders are not the only ones who can learn to use tools. After many generations of failing to break into the shelter, the seekers learn to jump over obstacles using ramps. However, after many millions of rounds of having their shelter breached, the hiders learn to take away the primary tool the seekers have at their disposal. Note that we do not explicitly incentivize any of these behaviors. As each team learns a new skill, it implicitly changes the challenges the other team faces, creating a new pressure to adapt. We've also put these agents into a more open-ended environment, uh, randomizing the objects, team I sizes, and show, uh, all of the this this will learn to do some of this. You can find the as uh, they can before the new tier in order to defend uh, uh, against box surfing. So how do agents acquire these skills? They're trained using reinforcement learning. While this world is far, um, also the, uh, the other point is also the uh, not only hide and seek. Uh, oh, if I go on, I should. Uh, on Earth, the simple rules of natural selection. And I should uh, briefly explain. This is the uh, from uh, Open AI. And uh, uh, agent discover progressively more complex tool and uh, while playing simple game on hide and seek. Um, self supervised um, imagine complexity in this uh, uh, in this example, simply um, uh, algorithm. But the, uh, the other side of the, um, uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking about for composer, the other also interesting uh, um, side is the, uh, there is also the time uh, process that you can really uh, observe easily 
a certain level of a complexity. And next slide is more complexity. At the end, how it goes like this. Um, with genetic algorithm, uh, you can simply get the result, and the process is also important. As musical composition, it, um, uh, it, the artwork of the um, time uh, uh, progress is based on the timeline. So the, this kind of <coughs> gradual process is also quite in, uh, interesting. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about also this hide and seek. But uh, this is also the uh, general overview of the March agent high and seek. Um, so at this point, it's quite hypothesis that there are also the something that can propose in uh, how this can be applied to March agency. But while um, I look for many examples, uh, I find also the one example of the Max and the MSP. It's called um, um, kinetic engine. Uh, what I found is the also the, um, the different uh, agent uh, based on the uh, conductor. So the, um, uh, the conductor can be replaced uh, something else, but uh, there's some um, uh, something like uh, to guide uh, for the each agent and generally uh, it's, uh, lead uh, how it progress. So this can be still, uh, it's already um, uh, uh, available uh, for this, but um, it's not something also quite exactly what I look for, but it's quite a um, uh, similar example. Um, <clears throat> this is only an uh, example uh, I just found, but I'm talking about something like a catalog, but I look for. But if the voice uh, the model uh, can be applied, but in this case, it has to be uh, uh, um, quite, um, each agent has to be uh, intelligent enough. What I saw is not, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say this is primitive, but uh, if this agent uh, have um, such an intelligent enough for the composition, this can be uh, simply applied. Um, just an example is Prisma dilemma, as you know. This is also the, um, at this point, uh, at this example, it's also a little bit uh, limited, but uh, if this is applied, uh, this, um, and also the, um, with this idea also conductor can be also the, um, the place with reinforcement learning. Uh, the other example I find quite interesting is not quite uh, much Asian, but um, it's, uh, um, um, it can be, uh, certain Asian can be grouped uh, uh, together. And then uh, if this can be also reinforcement learning can be applied, this, this is uh, one of the example. So um, <clears throat> um, this is the uh, things that um, I'm looking for right now. Uh, I didn't um, find any solution. Uh, so the, um, what I'm going to talk about uh, talking is there is no conclusion, but uh, this simply that I'm asking you that if uh, you can propose anything. Uh, we are music um, institution. We are not um, very specialized uh, this field. So uh, we call the collaborator if you're interested. In, um, so that's why uh, I'm, 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 I'd like to propose for today. So thank you very much. Um, you have uh, four minutes, so if you have any uh, question, or, yes. Um, so do you sometimes have propositions from the algorithm that are not playable by musicians, but yes. that you like? Yes, uh, most of them are like, like this. Most of them are like yeah. this. I, because without without uh, these tools, uh, I don't think I can do uh, something unexpected materials, but I ask the uh, deep learning to compose instead of me as a consequence, it is something of your only human player can do. So uh, I still talking um, but um, it was uh, not enough to human performer, but were, it was almost impossible to perform. Yeah. And for you, composing with algorithm, but still it's very important that it is human play like the human expressivity and interpretation for This you. is the uh, one of the um, uh, directions that we decided. Uh, instead of having the uh, many, many uh, possibilities, uh, well, 
I would say this is quite beginning uh, for us for the research. So the, we limited only this focus point, and we didn't want to have more technical side or complex side. We focus on the, the, the musicals as score. So that's the only reason. Uh, there are not uh, any specific other reason. For that. Okay, so um, uh, I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. So, uh, if I get it, you know, in the reinforcement learning case, uh, like one of the biggest ideas is to have this incentive because you want to construct a Q function. I mean, you need to have a way to define some form of score. Yeah. And I don't think it's pretty clear because, I mean, you just don't want to get caught. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is your, uh, I would say, idea or yeah, I don't know. How would you define a score in terms of composition, which is like kind of the main problem in this type of primitive systems? Um, I didn't quite get that. First of all, the uh, one thing is reinforcement learning, and also you're talking about the score, so I don't get no, the. Not the musical score. No, yeah. except, sorry, the performance, the reward, reward function. Like the performance of the, of the model. Okay. Uh, why um, I, I need. Um, uh, uh, like sort of the uh, conductor uh, in terms of the uh, reinforcement learning. Yeah, in yeah. reinforcement learning to, for the system to train, you need something that tells the system how good or bad it behaves. So in terms um, of music, I know. didn't uh, talk about this uh, much, but um, um, in fact, um, without uh, reinforcement learning, we don't see uh, what it did. Uh, for example, it mutually interacts. But if, uh, if we are let uh, do this, we don't know what happened. So uh, um, I just want to get uh, what happened. But um, if we emphasize like two players, two composers, and then how this can be interact each other, that's what I'm conductor. I'm talking about conductor. So maybe I didn't answer clearly. So later I can uh, we can discuss about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Jenem Kim. I'm from uh, University of ERs. I'm the students. Uh, I'm a doctor students of intermediate department. Uh, today, I'm gonna introduce one like interesting tool or idea. It is an intelligent assistant vocal orchestration tool. So in GetEye, yeah, we have many composers and artists. Maybe you are interested in this tool. Maybe you can use it as you are like creation pre creating tool. So today I'm gonna talk about what is work idea and what is assist assistant uh, orchestration and static orchestration. And finally I'm gonna talking about dynamic orchestration in uh, work work idea. So first, uh, what is work idea? Uh, this is the uh, intelligent assistant orchestration tool, which is developed in Earcom. Uh, it is a tool of, uh, it is a, a kind of uh, home 
framework in MaxMSP. So you are uh, familiar with MaxMSP, you can download it in this website. And there is a uh, good tutorials about it, so you can use it as of your study materials. Uh, in Ork idea, uh, there is uh, some kind of AI uh, AI stuff like mono objective optimization and uh, based on it, it can give you some kind of logical answers uh, what you're interested in. So here is a link about Ork idea where you can uh, search it search by Google about it. And this uh, slide, the contents of this slide is based on the Ork idea official tutorial written by Kavalia Imane Pisala. And this is the a tutorial you will find when you download it, uh, this framework. So today, uh, contents of, uh, of these slides based on these three. So uh, uh, before the uh, before the development of development of this assistant assist intelligent assist orchestration, there is a, some kind of uh, history or of free studies. The first the English composer uh, Jonathan Harvey. So he uh, he made some kind of uh, bell sound based on the uh, various sound synthesis strategy, and uh, in music there is a, a special spectralism. So which is the which is the kind of composition technique based on the uh, harmonics of sound, and uh, it can be a kind of the starting point of kind in these fields. So after that, there is a so many kinds of researches about it, and, and finally there uh, the intelligent assistant mechanic uh, orchestration uh, now became. So what is assistive orchestration? Uh, in music, there is a relationship between signals and symbols. You can think about signals like uh, sounds or the audio signals, and symbol is kind of uh, notation, musical notation. So, uh, composition or orchestration is kind of uh, writing symbols and creating signals based on the on that signals. <coughs> so uh, in work idea they, uh, in this system there uh, they focus on the connection between symbolic space and uh, signal space and relations of between them. And work idea try to find the relationship and try to try to find an answer between them. So in order to make a solution or to, you know to try to give new uh, relationship uh, numerical relationship uh, it based on the some uh, several AI techniques. So this is the problem statement. Uh, you give this system, you give this system a sound or signals, then it can give you a score or the orchestration, uh, orchestra score. So, so normally in serial, uh, uh, serialism music, uh, uh, people try to find the harmonics of the sound, and they compose the harmonics as 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 their uh, musical key or mode. So it is a kind of uh, so composition based on the numbers. So in this system, uh, uh, Ork idea interpret uh, 
the signals as a number, and this system gives you the, the final score for some. Uh, to do that, uh, this system, so basically use it two strategies. So one is a, a split the a signal, uh, audio signals, and uh, these some um, do some AI AI uh, AI AI things, and finally it connected as a final uh, form of uh, sound and scores. So the first example is static orchestration, meaning you can use a static sound, not changing pitches. Uh, Orc idea uh, do not give you the uh, proportion of musical idea, it just gives you the answer of your ask, ask. So it, uh, what work idea did is a calculation. And so uh, this is the main object of work idea. So the name of it is solved. They try to solve the problem you did. So today uh, we try to make a we try uh, we try to see the basic um, patch of it. So what idea? So yeah, this is the uh, starting point. And to do that, uh, this system must understand or must know the numbers you get. That is the amplitude and frequencies frequency of your sound. So you have to, in order to, uh, in order to know your frequencies and amplitude, this sound use these two main strategies. Uh, Fourier's uh, F of T is a. Uh, this is a one. Uh, strategy to find the frequencies, uh, harmon uh, ha your harmonics frequencies and amplitude, and mouth frequency capsule. Uh, this is the uh, similar this FFT, and but uh, in, uh, in more into the perception of uh, human beings. So, in order to idea, uh, uh, it use database system for this problem solving. And beside this FFT and uh, uh, spectrum uh, analysis and MFCC, it, it, uh, it rely on many of these uh, problem solving information on this uh, database. So you also need work idea database. So the third map. And orchestra setting. Uh, uh, this is the uh, intelligent assistant orchestration tool. So definitely you need to set your uh, instruments. So uh, you can you can use the um, uh, well known abbreviation here, but you can change these names based on your database. So in this uh, examples of from the tutorial, uh, they use this typical uh, every uh, abbreviation of orchestration. Or you can use uh, dynamics and articulation what you want, uh, but in this uh, video, uh, in this speech, we don't use it. Uh, 
this is the kind of uh, technical part. Uh, for the uh, analysis, you need uh, you need to give Orca idea some optimization parameters like uh, uh, partial uh, um, uh, like pop setting, uh, epoch sound, and so forth. So uh, basically, you can use the default settings, but uh, in this uh, in uh, in in this picture, uh, these number from the uh, tutorial example patches. So, you, or you can use it. Or there is there are some proposals from uh, in the tutorial, so you can use it. So now I use the this number from the tutorial. So uh, let's check the first example of it. So uh, in the middle, yeah, here is a work idea of object. Uh, you're gonna give, you gonna uh, analysis your uh, sound, and it are gonna give you simple answers uh, of it. So this is the database, and the middle of it, uh, I set it the uh, instruments setting. And here is the uh, sounds. So if I click this button, these three in, uh, information goes to here, and it will gonna give that answer to the uh, these two objects. One is to save the final uh, sounds answers, and one is the score answer. But in this example. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, framework, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the fi uh, famous uh, uh, framework in MSP, uh, in Max MSP, uh, which is the support the algorithmic convolution. So, <clears throat> yeah, the input sound I used is. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is the input signal. Yeah, actually, this is the one of the uh, synthesized the bell sound, but uh, you can find that it is a natural bell sound. So this is the input sound. So uh, if you want to interpret these sounds as a orchestral sound. So you can use it. Um, it can give you very uh, interesting answers. So this is the answer. Yeah, here is a yeah. You can see my solution. So my solution here, the play object uh, uh, can approach the memory space of it. So you can play that sound. It's a kind of very interesting answer. So uh, this work idea interpret that uh, interpret this sound as the uh, this uh, yeah this I you can get.
Uh, anyway, you can change uh, the input signal H1 or files. So you can try any sound, nature sound, or your music. Um, uh, when, when, uh, if you want to change the result, there is some more param parameters of it. <clears throat> so one is sparsity. So it can uh, select or it can, the system uh, can ignore some instruments of it. Uh, partial filtering. Uh, the system uh, can use Mm. So it, uh, based on uh, the number, uh, the system can use all and select uh, the number of sounds. So with that signal, uh, with that parameters, I can change the results. So now we have these two new parameters. The first, uh, when I uh, select this, uh, the instrument setting is the same. When I press this zero, the system use whole uh, instruments that I set. So the answer, the sound, uh, is uh, changed. This is the this is the Input sound, the same one, and this is the answer. This, the, this is the sound that came from the, all of these instruments. If I change the setting, uh, this system uh, neglects some uh, instruments based on the algorithms. Another solution you can change based on this book, uh, these parameters. But maybe this is not what you wanted because the normally the sound is changing okay, uh, in terms of pitch timbers. So the next, uh, the last example is dynamic orchestration. That's of course that changes. So these uh, in the in this stage, uh, work idea cut the signal into some segments and analysis and change the uh, find the answer and reconnect them as the form of sounds and scores. Uh, in this stage, and in this stage, you have to use to. Uh, Parameter first is just espresso, and the second one is time gaze. Uh, the system uses threshold as the cutting point, and time gaze is the basic size of it. And next one, you have to solve, uh, you have to choose. The segmentation policies, the uh, uh, frames versus plus. Uh, frames means you want to use the sound uh, equal length. But normally, the normal sounds, the uh, transient of normal sound, uh, do not distribute like this way. So the basic set, uh, default setting of four here is a plus. The flux uses. Uh, the threshold idea and the uh, amplitude of input sound is uh, divided the input source, not the uh, input lines, based on the, 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 the 
cuts the sound uh, based on the, the big peak uh, amplitude. Uh, the final uh, parameter you have to check is the connection policies. Uh, this is the best versus closest. The best means uh, doesn't mean the best answer. Uh, it means the uh, it means the uh, the best parameter try to uh, matches the target sound as much as possible. But in music. Uh, changing instruments or uh, changing instrument, uh, changing voice, changing voice is not uh, maybe is not a good uh, situation. So the closest uh, connect the solution minimize the movement of each of instruments, like the transitional voice loading of music. So this is the final example of. So now we have very big objects here. Uh, he, uh, this is set up many, many of uh, arguments for the optimizer, optimizer setting and uh, segments and connection. So yeah, here is a you can here is a we we set a threshold and time gate and uh, um, um, sorry. Yeah, maybe I lost some parameters and segmentation and uh, the connection. Yeah, now we have a uh, different input source. Um, yeah, sound available. And it changes uh, the uh, temporary and pitches, it changes. And the answer is. Yeah, it's a kind of very interesting solution. But uh, yeah, uh, as the same way, uh, same with the previous example, you can change the uh, parameters and you can do get different answers. For it. Or you can change the uh, frequency analysis uh, algorithms. Yeah, so different answers. Yeah, yeah, that's, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, actually, I, I studied this framework just for weeks, and I find this is a very interesting uh, framework. Maybe uh, we, can use, we can use it as a composition tools, maybe creating just one, one of uh, the various uh, interesting sounds for your cases. Um, if you're interested, uh, check the website and download it and let's use it. Thank you. Do you have any comments or questions? Maybe I can. I can. Uh, I can. I can talk about my different points. Yeah.
how would you consider making a good piece? Or do you see it more like arranging solutions of Orchidia as a food, as making a food piece? Or would you think more, you have an idea of the food piece, and for some very specific part of the piece, mm -hmm. you think that you would need Orchidia? Um, at this stage, I am. Uh, I don't know full functions of it. At this point, I just find it is uh, good to make some specific sound. Uh, uh, specifically, uh, uh, specifically, uh, the sounds of it is uh, not that natural. The, the orchestration sound is not that the real one. Mm -hmm. So I think it is the. At this point, it is good to boy, uh, make some interesting sounds of it. But that you will use in computer, like in digital composition, or like that you will make play by artist? Uh, yeah, for, uh, to to play uh, to play with real expression that the final score answers with this. Would be enough. Would you rather have the score be played by musician, the score that is assembled with Orchidia, or you would like to maybe render it? With um, personally, yeah. The personally, I want to use it as the make a sound, and I want to make a more effects. So like so smooth transition of the real sound as the, uh, into the. The synthesis is okay. so I'm gonna I'm gonna use it next bit of next my case. Yeah. Thank you. Do I need it or um, it? if you prefer but uh, <laughs> no, I think we can be like it's better than like this? Yeah, than it's, like it's, it's actually not working. No, uh, <laughs> now it's okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Right. Actually, yeah. Whoa, oh, oh, huge tire. Okay, so hello everybody. Since I have only 30 minutes and I have two demonstrations plus 100 slides, I'm going to be super efficient. So uh, my name is Philippe Essling. I'm a professor at IRCAM and Sorbonne University in Paris, where I'm teaching machine learning uh, applied to music. So for those of you who don't know IRCAM, but I'm going to go super fast because I think we talked about it enough. It's kind of a cool research center. Uh, in Paris, where we do lots of stuff, so there is lots of different departments and uh, acoustics, analysis, synthesis, physical modeling, and I'm part of this team called Musical Representation. And we also have a master's, if some of you are interested to come. And inside this team, I actually created this group called uh, Artificial Creative Intelligence and Data Science, or for short, ACIDS. So uh, the idea at the beginning of the research was actually to really target this problem. Okay, so the idea was to try to model uh, the problem of musical creativity, but specifically inside um, musical orchestration. So why musical orchestration? Because nobody was doing it. And uh, the cool thing about musical orchestration is that it's kind of the wild west of scientific research and, I mean, uh, music and computer music, actually. So the problem is that it's a problem of writing, so you're writing a score, but at the same time you're writing given some spectral information, right? So you have to take into account both some symbolic problem and a signal problem at the same time. So the generalization for me is to any form of audio mixtures. If you even take drum and bass, for instance, you usually select the snare and the kicks to belong together, and you will select different types of elements so that they 
belong together, that there is actually absolutely no theory about why things go well together. You know, we have a theory of time, which is the counterpoint, and we have the theory of the opposite side, which is actually the harmony. But we don't really have this spectral theory of why do things go together? Why do they mix together? And for me, it's really a question of time and how do we combine temporal properties? So this is one of the aspects which is understanding it so that we can interact with it. So the idea of interacting is more seen here as a here as a co-creativity. So we kind of avoid this question as is this the AI that did this or not? We just say we are co-creating with the AI. So the idea is that the human feeds the system, but the system by answering feeds the human as well. And of course, the goal of all this research is still to generate stuff. So we want to create with this tool. So we want something that can ideate and we want easy ways to explore inside it. So uh, the team I created actually has um, some interesting names instead of these simple things we like to use very complicated names as scientists so these are the actual real names so i'm going to go super fast but we are mostly looking at music structure discovery in a multivariate and multimodal space with multi-scale we love multi stuff right and the goal is to do generative modeling so today i'm going to quickly go through some of the things we did in the past years, but I'm going to focus on one specific topic that we are actually working a lot and with lots of cool stuff, I think. So what you've just seen or KD is actually something uh, I worked on when I was in my PhD uh, thesis. And uh, the idea was, so have you seen, to try to take any sound and can we find a score for which we can produce a sound that sounds the same, right? So the question is, we have a target, we want to find this combination of instruments. So I had very cool examples, but you actually magnificently showed that it's kind of working. So the previous version was called uh, Orchid. So Orchidea is actually simply a Max MSP toolbox uh, that is simplest to use. And my demo is running in the background, so sorry. Little spoiler, but I have to stop this because it's actually controlled by something cool, but the problem is it activates when I go in front of it. So this was a previous uh, research, uh, so it dates back to 2009, uh, the first system. So now we're working a lot more with the, uh, actually this thing is not really inside the realm of artificial intelligence. It's more of a combinatorial heuristics, right? So genetic algorithm for me, which is different. But the question is that everybody is talking about artificial intelligence and it makes quite no sense to talk about this because it would mean that we know what artificial intelligence is. So when I talk about intelligence, I like to go on big philosophical questions. Like, for instance, I always ask my students, like, can you create a new animal right now? And I'm asking you the same question, and I'm not really interested in knowing what is the animal you created. But think about the process you went through. Maybe some of you took a dog and a snake and they did a snake or something like this. So you mostly took some existing elements inside your bank of knowledge and you tried to combine them in some smart way. So I like to quote some people that are way more intelligent than me, like William Blake. And he said this thing, which is, man can only desire what he has already perceived, which is a very interesting quote because it means that you can't really do ex nihilo creation. So the fact that we can't do ex nihilo creation doesn't mean we can't try to assemble things in a very clever way, which is actually what might be intelligence is the capacity to assemble two things that seemed heterogeneous. And it, you can find this inside most of science. For instance, we gathered the earth and the sky through gravity, and we gathered like electricity and magnetism in electromagnetism. And we also did, so if you look at science, it's actually mostly based on taking two things and making them together. So the idea is even better explained by Noam Chomsky, which is to take two concepts and create a third one without impairing the two firsts, which I really like. So basically, I'm here to talk about something that now we don't really talk about these things. So since it's quite hazy to talk about this concept, we mostly focus on this thing called machine learning. You've all heard about it. But I want to take a quick uh, summary, I'd say I'd like you to, to get away with something that you can use in a bar to pretend that you know. 
And so basically, we are trying to model creativity. So machine learning is actually trying to optimize some form of function. So most of the time, you can reduce any problem as this form of problem. It is you have an input x, and you're trying to find a solution y through a function f that has parameters. So tweaking these parameters will get you closer to the solution you're looking for, right? So to get closer means that you have a way of evaluating the quality of this approximation. So you kind of know what's the difference of what you are inferring and what is the actual solution. So it's a very fancy way of saying how bad am I behaving given the parameters of my function, right? The biggest problem we have right now is that there is a huge discrepancy between these two things. So this is the expected risk. The expected risk would mean we are able to evaluate our function and how well we behave across all possible parameter of the function, which means we could evaluate what will be the best way to optimize this function. But we can't really, because this is mostly usually unsolvable in se except for very simple case. So we usually reduce this to having a data set of example, and we just you know, try to infer what is the quality of our function on this reduced thing. So the problem, I will come back to it later, will be evident when uh, we talk about creativity. So I just like a quick reminder for those of you who don't know what a neural network is. So a neural network is actually a very simple thing. So it's a very, very simple thing, which is you have an input, you put some weights on different input, and then if it's over a threshold, then it activates. So this is one neuron. So one neuron, actually, if you rewrite the thing in a different way, what you get is a very simple thing. So y equals ax plus b in a little bit more complicated manner. So what does that mean is that one neuron is actually simply a line inside a two-dimensional space. So if you have something in three dimensions, it means a plane. If you have four, it's an hyperplane, blah, blah, blah. So basically, a neuron just divides the space. So it looks weird to say, oh, this thing is intelligent. It just cuts the space in two. But actually, the cool thing about neural networks is that they are combinatorial somehow. So the, com sorry, composition. <laughs> so the idea is that if you want to approximate any form of function, you will just need three layers of processing. It's called the universal approximation theorem, which means that combining this line, for instance, I have one line telling me if I'm left or right, then another left or right, and then another, let's say, left or right. And if I combine those three, then I can get a more complex division of the space. So with this in mind, we actually used neural networks to do other types of stuff regarding orchestration. So the idea was, can we reverse what I just showed, which is, can we take a piano piece and make it for the whole orchestra? So the idea is that we took lots of these pairs of piano pieces and orchestral version and vice versa. And then we used something which I'm not going to detail too much, which is a form of multivariate predictive learning. So this is neural networks, neural networks, and different way of communicating between them. And basically, these are the results. So everything is open source if you want to check it. And there is even some very bad real-time version. So the idea is that you take this as input. <laughs> stop because I'm already out of time. That's the output of the network. So it kind of learns how to... Oh. Oh, sorry. So basically the network kind of learns how to take something which is played for the piano and to affect the different melodic lines to different instruments. It's pretty amazing how good a job it does because basically it can do uh, octave doublings that you can't really see because of my very crappy definition. And it does very interesting stuff, but sometimes it also puts a single note for the whole score for an instrument. For instance, this is the trumpet and it's playing one note over the whole piece, which is completely stupid, right? 
So that's some interesting points. We also did some things around generation of waveform with this type of model. So we basically used um, a model called Sample RNN. So this was like three years ago we did this. So Sample RNN, we didn't do the model. It's actually a model that was done in uh, the Miller lab. But our idea was, can we give the composer more control over the generation? So we added some form of conditioning, which was not done at the time. And interestingly, it was used in an opera by uh, uh, composer, and what he wanted to do was not really to hear the end game of the machine, but more the way the machine evolves towards. So it's for me, it's a very geeky way of seeing it, and I love it because it's kind of hearing the learning procedure. Like, can we hear? And the interesting fact is that this model was trained on the book of Frankenstein, uh, uh, spoken in German. And the idea was to make a reboot of Frankenstein, and it was called the Monster Machine. And after several days of training, the model would actually just say Ich, Ich, which in German means I, which was very disturbing. And um, so you can hear I have multiple examples. So the first, after like no training, just one iteration, what you get is actually random noise logical because you initialize these models with noise. After one day of training, it starts to do this type of events. You can hear sometimes there are some part of voices moving. Then after two days of training, it has learned to shut up and to create you know, events inside the flux of noise. And after this one is, I think, five days, no, sorry, this is still four days, but you can still hear some voice trying to form. And after, I think, ten days... Interestingly, this is not French. For those of you who might not speak French, this is nonsensical language. Because the model has a template scope of 500 milliseconds. So it cannot have any form of information about semantics. It's just producing something that kind of feels like human language, but which is no language at all. And we train the same thing on opera singing, and this is the result. So usually I first make you listen to this and then I come back and tell you actually it's not only the singing that was generated, it's actually every point of the waveform. And if you listen again, take a closer attention to the strings part, because the strings part is actually also generated by the model. Oh, sorry, this is with Schubert as uh, input. There is no attack in the violin, right? And it's just playing this weird. Now, and it's following the voice because it's just basically it's still nonsensical in terms of the semantics of music. Let's try to generate something which is logical in terms of the structure of the row waveform, right? So now I'd like to go in space. I have 14 minutes left. So basically, if we go back to what I said about what neural networks are doing, there is another way to interpret. So this is kind of the same uh, equation I showed you, but in a different way of looking at it. It's also some form of way to transform the space. So if I take how one layer of neural networks behaves, it's also doing this thing, which is basically transforming the space so as to shear it and turn it somehow. Okay. So when you have lots of neurons, then you have like more complicated transforms. So this leads to a very interesting hypothesis, and the one we've been working most with, which is called the manifold hypothesis. And I love to do my little uh, very kind of uh, graphical thing. I'm going to take one of my uh, soft toys, by the way. So this is a piece of paper, right? <coughs> so how many dimensions do you think it has? Two dimensions, right? I can go up and down, left and right, but not really backwards. Now, 
How many dimensions does this thing have? Thank you, synthesizer. So I can do in depth, but it's still the same object. So that's the whole idea of the manifold hypothesis, is that most of the interesting information, even though it seems that it's in a very complicated space, it lives in a very simple one, which is just mangled over each other. So the goal of this idea is we can find some way of transforming this thing back to its original sub-dimensions, and now it's super easy to go inside the space, right? So this is very relevant to our creative learning creative learning problem. So, sorry, synthesizer again, I have to shut it up. Sorry. So, what I was saying is that now we're gonna take a more uh, probabilistic approach. And I just want to get you a little bit of feeling about how, uh, it's been a long time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, if you consider the data that is following a distribution, so in probabilistic term, it seems a little bit weird uh, for those of you who don't know probability, but keep with me, it's super simple, actually. Let's say if I look at the distribution of something, I get this form, which just tells me what is the probability of obtaining one number or the other. So basically what this says, let's say for instance, this is the difference in temperature between today and one year before today, okay? So mostly if I just take some new individuals inside this population, so this is the population, right? There is more things here than here. So basically if I just sample, which means taking observations inside this population, I will get different results. So now this seems like, okay, so you're just having some way of saying how many things you're gonna have of something. But if you think of different information, like for instance, difference in temperature, dependent on where you are on the globe, then you can get more complicated things because you are actually looking at what's called the conditional uh, information. So the conditional distribution gives you how the same thing behaves given some information. So now how do we define this learning problem? So learning is looking for the answer given the input. So it's really knowing what is the probability of our answer given what we are looking at. So this can be defined as this problem, which is basically the same where we input the parameters inside, okay? So it's a pretty simple way of looking at it, even though it looks complicated, and you're gonna say, oh, come on, why do you add more mathematics? We already had enough. So the cool thing with this is that now that we define this with a probabilistic way, instead of having this type of answers from our networks, we can get some actual uncertainty about what we are getting. So we can actually know what is the certainty of the answer that we are taking out. But in our case, we are more interested into the generative problem. So what I showed you is getting an answer out of an input. So now what we want to do is we want just to generate new stuff that is logical. So to do that, remember that this problem might be too complex to solve. I talked about it earlier. So we're going to do something which is introducing even more problems because we're going to add a new variable. We're going to add something called the latent variable. So the latent variable is actually something that is hidden from us. Something that is hidden, but it's a lot easier in terms of the size the dimensionality of this is actually smaller. So what does this mean? It means that there is some explanation which is simple and that could lead to generate something which is complex. And we could infer this information from what we observe or we could use this to generate new stuff. What does this mean? For instance, if my latents are categorical things about face, I could say that I want to generate a face which is happy, for instance, but I can generate a lot of it. Okay, but remember we have uncertainty now. So I could do the same for something more neutral. So the problem is now we have more variables, but it's actually a better way to control the way we're gonna generate the things uh, that we want. So this problem can be laid out as an integration. Once again, this is usually completely impossible to solve. So just for those who know what I'm talking about, 
there is actually a very nice way to summarize both variational and uh, generative adversarial networks in terms of this form of function. So basically what we're going to do, it's pretty simple, keep with me, we're going to try to approximate something complex with something simpler but that is close enough so that we get some interesting solution. So why would we do that? Still, again, remember the sheet of paper. So what we're trying to do is from this very complex information, we want to lay it out in something very simple so that if we have this transform that allows us to go from the complex to the simple space, and in terms of probability, we just write it a little bit differently, then we can get something very cool about creativity, right? Because now we have the possibility of evaluating emotion, for instance, of the face orientation. What does this mean? Is that I can generate and I can even control the high level properties of my generation. So supposedly I'm super late, so I'm just gonna show you. The problem is this is unsupervised, so mostly what I'm gonna show you as examples is what we call autoencoders. So autoencoders do this type of things by compressing the information and then trying to reconstruct it from this compressed information. So I'm gonna go super fast, sorry. So the idea is I take my input, I just encode it to my high level variables. So this is compressing. And then from these compressed things, if I can recreate it, this means that I've learned something. But this is a deterministic way. So this is very limited because we have no guarantees on what's happening in there, right? So a good way of changing that is actually to do variational autoencoders. So I'm gonna go super fast once again, sorry. So basically we encode as before, we try to compress the information, but now we encode to something that is called the mean and variance of the distribution. It simply means we are trying to encode something which is approximately where should be this information. The cool thing about that is that instead of generating from one point, we're going to generate from any point inside this little circle. So this means that if the circles overlap, but they don't belong to similar information, then it should generate things that do not make any sense, right? If I have things that are closed in this space and I can generate on the overlap, then it has to be similar. So this type of models have been on for like quite a few times, it's been five years, but it does this really cool spaces where you have like very interesting way of handling the information. So of course, there are some quirks about it, but for instance, you can get this cool type of interpolations. So actually, because I'm super, super late, I'm going to skip. And because uh, I think uh, Takeyu will explain <laughs> normalizing flows, like, <laughs> sorry, I took too much time at the beginning. Actually, I'm skipping around 50 slides. So I can show you the musical aspect. And if someone is interested in normalizing flow, which I'm skipping right now, you can come and see afterwards. So basically, we use this ID to do some weird stuff. So for instance, uh, we did this uh, tumble space. So tumble space is actually a way of analyzing the audio information and regenerating. So basically what we do is we encode, as I said, but at the same time we regularize this space by using perceptual metrics. So the cool results is that we obtain a space which is three-dimensional, so we can generate any instrument from actually a vector of three floating point numbers. So for instance, here is the reconstruction of a clarinet from three real numbers. Of course I'm saying three real numbers, but there is like a model of 100 megabytes behind it. But then the cool thing is that uh, this is a follow-up work by uh, Adrian that he's going to talk about. We can do some cool properties, uh, transfer properties. So for instance, if we transfer part of the piano inside, so you can hear the attack of the piano, but at the same time, it has this property of the and kind of someone blowing at the same time on the chord, it's super weird. I'm gonna go fast, I'm gonna show you another cool thing we did, which is actually to use the same thing, but this time for drum sounds. So the drum sounds we regenerate directly on the waveform, so we use something called a multi-head spectrum inversion, which is pretty cool because this allows us to do this weird 
thing. So basically here, I'm generating from the space, so each point is going to generate a waveform, and I'm just traveling inside the space, okay? And another model generates the events. So basically, all of this is generating using what I just showed you. So there is a real-time model, and once again, Adrian is going to show some more recent stuff about that. I just want to, you to pay attention to what I said about this idea of compressing into a well-organized space. You can see it well if you look at the hi-hat, because if you look at how the hi-hat is generated, every time it's generating something near, it's actually sounding a lot similar. It's a very smooth evolution, right? So I went way overboard, way. I had this crazy argument about creativity and stuff. But I think, too bad. OK, maybe another time. So if you want to know my crazy ideas about creativity, I'm going to do it later. So what I want to show you is the most recent thing we've been doing is uh, working based on this model called differential digital signal processing which is the idea of taking traditional signal processing models and make it differentiable. So this uh, was published by Engel, uh, like uh, it's not even very published yet. So the idea is uh, to try to train a control model over this thing. And based on that, we can make interesting transfers. For instance, this is a voice. Um, well over the and this is the output of the model, just based on the voice. So it's working extremely well. Ah, sorry. Ah, stop. Okay, and I'm just taking my last 45 seconds to show you something which I think is very interesting, but now Teke is going to present for half an hour. So I'm just going to make the demo, which is the coolest part, right? So if you take synthesizers, synthesizers are these very complex functions with lots of knobs, right? And even though when you control the thing, it's quite easy to generate, if you know the synthesis, the biggest question when you do actually synthesis, synthesis work, sorry, is to try to do this, right? You have some audio output in mind, and you want to find the parameters of your synthesizer that does the same thing. But this is almost impossible. Most of the time, you spend hours tweaking your knobs. And the other question is, how do we control this in a better way? So meaning, can we find a way to actually put a wave file inside the synthesizer and obtain the parameters, or a way to have a simpler control over this thing, which has 200 knobs? And basically, this is something we did uh, like six months ago, which is called universal synthesizer control with normalizing flows. So I'm not going to show you how it works, because now Take will handle that. I'm just going to do a cool demo. So the cool demo, I hope it's going to work, as always, with demos. So this thing is actually based on learning. Uh, so behind this thing, there is Diva, right? So if I listen to, this is the init patch, sexy. So init patch is kind of, you know, it's kind of lame. The problem is if I want to find the sound I want, I'm gonna to have to spend hours trying to tweak these things. So now, instead of doing that, yeah, that's the funny part, but then, it's not taking out the fun that to take away file, just drop it there, and then having this way file. Okay, so so you didn't see it, but it was optimized in less than twenty milliseconds. So, for instance, I'm taking another one. So it's optimizing the parameters of the synth in less than 20 milliseconds, and you can see that it's finding a point that is very close to what I wanted. So the cool thing is that I also have the possibility of 
listening to my presets. So for instance, now I'm using my new preset, but I can change it to whatever I want. My library of presets is also organized based on these characteristics. So for instance, I can find like different types of sounds. So let's say I'm putting like, hey, sorry. It's not there. Oh, okay, anyways. So for instance, in this part of the space, so this is the similar type of compressed space with a little tweet. So this part is actually sounds that are, I don't know how to say, gnarly. So as you can see, I'm moving around presets, yet they still sound similar. If I go to the opposite end of the space, it's actually things that sound super slow and smooth, right? And now let's take something that I like. So I can actually select something that I like really. Okay. And I can put it with. And the coolest thing with this model is that I can actually control the parameters of the synthesizer in real time by moving inside the open space. So as you can see, if I move only one dimension in the latent space, it still moves all the parameters of the synthesizer at once. Because it has to organize the whole parameter space. But now I can control the synthesizer with only one move on my head. Which is quite cool if I need to compose something super fast. So, if you want to know how this works, you will have to listen to Naotake, which is going to present this. I don't know if people ask questions. We don't have time for questions. Oh, I mean, like, you, you can have my time. I'll finish early. So. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I that you were spending a bit shorter than half an hour. I mean, if anyone has a question, go for it. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Pretty amazing. Uh, I had this question that for different neural networks, we can have either the waveform as input mm -hmm. or maybe like the frequency spectrum. Do you see a general trend of what works better for you or it's like differs from that? I think it really depends on your question, right? Like, uh, what I mean is that, for instance, there is two same side. I mean, two different sides of the same coin, which is this kind of false disparity between discriminative and generative. And yeah, there is a paper by Bishop, which is in 2006, which shows that it's actually exactly the same problem, anyways. But actually, when you want to analyze stuff, like mostly doing. Uh, you know, music information retrieval or anything that is more into the first thing I showed, which is having the answer based on your input. Then mostly like the Fourier transform gives you a very compact and nice representation. But at the same time, why it doesn't work? Because like the convolutional aspect, I don't, are you yeah. easy with, okay, so I can go full scale. So the problem is you don't have the same stationary pro stationarity properties inside your Fourier transform, right? Because there is no locality. At the same time, you have different statistics at different parts. So even though I would say the Fourier transform is cool because it's super compressed, at the same time, it does not enjoy the properties that makes convolutional networks super efficient. So right now, I've been, for a long time, I would say Fourier transform is best if you want to analyze stuff. But nowadays, like the row waveform models seems also to be starting to be above. And for generation, it's obviously better if you can work similarly, I think the latest model we've been working on is actually a mixture. So what you do is, ah, I didn't have the time to show it properly, but the idea is that you can actually use the waveform generation, but the Fourier transform is still differentiable, right? Mm -hmm. So what you can actually do is use the Fourier transform to evaluate the loss. And so you mostly evaluate your loss functions in the Fourier space, mm -hmm. but then you can still differentiate and have the generation to the waveform. 
I think mixed tubes. Mixed yeah, mixed tubes are always. Hey, it's always what you can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But for generation, you know, the problem is that the Fourier transform is complex, mm -hmm. and your networks and complex numbers <laughs> they they don't play well. Though. I tried for years. I I tried. Uh, uh, thank you. And just one, maybe if you want to generate like very long scale density of spectrum, like there was this paper like where they like this kind of um, uh, pixel LNN style on on MEL spectrogram, yeah. and they show that they can like model maybe like I don't know like 20 second, 40 second of musical structure. Yeah. So then this in the waveform domain becomes like kind of yeah. impossible. <laughs> yeah, it's too much high dimensional, so. You want to generate at a very, very long scale, then still waveform models are not so stupid for that. I see. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, and also here yeah, on the um, yeah. GitHub page, there is uh, one part of the repository where it's called like documents, where you can download the slides. Like they are not all yet on that, but I will make sure that all the presenters give me that slide, or at least some kind of PDF compact or something. So you can also like check out some things that are either too fast or missing. Yeah, we skipped the too fast. And it was the most interesting of course. You will give me something here. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Naoki Masuda. I'm a master student at the University of Tokyo, and I work with Philip on the synthesizer stuff that we just showed. And i like to give some uh, explanations and like some, yeah, some bit more results maybe on that. So synthesizers, I think everyone knows, and like, I mean, I think people know about synthesizers more than I do, because this is like, you guys are experts maybe. But you know, synthesizers, you know, there's like lots of synthesizers and like, as Philip mentioned, there's like a lot of parameters that we, we need to tweak. You know, like there's like subtractive synthesizers. It looks very simple, right? I mean, we just use a filter to shake a sound, but like, you know, but in reality, like, you know. So we just want to make a really basic sound right here. Wait, it's a bit quiet. So this is like a really basic Gruber based sound that like you know everyone likes to or, or at least in the 90s they don't like to use it. <laughs> but like so and it's really simple, like you know, we just set the oscillator one to four voices, set the trigger to off, set the stereo to five or something, and then set the oscillator two to some setting, and then like we have an amplitude envelope and like you can filter a and set the oscillator to you and like, you know, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> controls and like, and like, you know, it just, it's act, it comes from an actual website telling you to do this, to make this sound. Like, I mean, it's stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also uh, we're dealing with FM synthesis, which is, I think some of you know that like, it's even more difficult than like, it's, it's just plain headache. Uh, you know, like Yamaha DX7 and, and all that sort of stuff. But you know, like small changes in the parameter can change it, like change the sound, like really drastically. And you know, and like the spectrogram is, you know, like the, each each like element of the spectrogram is like a sole function, something, something. And, you know, I I cannot deal with this stuff. And also, like the problem with synthesizers is that they all they're all different, and they, they all use like different algorithms and you can't use them in the same way, so like we we need to like find a way to you know like make that easy. And so like in our research, we just treat the synthesizer as a black box. You know, you just 
feed the parameters and then comes audio, right? But this relationship between the parameter and the audio is like very nonlinear and like, you know, some parameters, they don't mean much, but some parameters are very important. So we, we're trying to learn a relationship between the synthesizer parameters and the synthesizer like output. And like there's like some previous research and like, so this research try uh, like this previous research tried to like, you know, just the parameters from the audio by like an LSDN network. And it's like kind of okay, that's so good. But you know, and but we want to do like more than that. Uh, so we, we, we develop a, a more complete model of this synthesizer control. So we use a variational autoencoder that Philip mentioned earlier. And also, so like we use variational autoencoder to get this Z, which is like the latent space, you know, like the compact information. And also we use like a, we use the normalizing flows to learn like a mapping between parameters and the Z. So we, we basically have like the odd, the relationship between audio and the parameters. So like I, Okay, well, I mean, I'll, all this, I mean, Philip explained this like really good, so I, I can skip all this, but you know, so variational tangles, they give you like a generative model, you know, like, and it's like math. But, but so like, I just want, I just want you to know that like variational tangles, they just don't, you know, you know about GANs, right? Have yeah. you heard of GANs? It's like GANs but cooler. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so like there's some researchers that use the variational encoders to get an audio, and like this this is a bit old research, so like it's not that good. But you know, like, oh, I can't see the mouse. So this is an organ, and this is a I cannot see the mouse. So, well. Oh, it's not, oh, okay. <laughs> this is this is a flute sound, and you know, like, so you can like combine two sounds by like interpolating between the like, variables, kind of. And also, like as Philip mentioned earlier, so well, this is like a regularized latent space, but in general, like variational autoencoders, the latent variables are like you know organized neatly so we can like leverage the structure of these latent spaces and also i need to explain about normalizing flows because we did not mention them but you know normalizing flows is a bit niche it's, it's pretty new kind of topic but you know we just we just learn the mapping between two probability distributions and this this like mapping is like invertible, which is like, as we find out, it's very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it's just change of variables, but um, yeah, and like you can like combine, you, you just combine these transforms to make a chain, and like, you get like a very complex distribution one. <coughs> But anyways, so, so like this, our, our model can do like parameter inference, microcontrol learning, semantic microcontrol learning, and like some preset neighborhood exploration, which <coughs> doesn't make sense to you right now, but like I'll explain these like one by one. So, okay, so parameter inference. So we have like some audio that we wanted to replicate, right? replicate with the synthesizer. So we just feed the audio into the encoder, you get the Z, and then we have a mapping between the Z and the parameters. So you get the parameters, and yeah, that's that's it. That's it. So that's like, that's one of the examples that Philip showed. And also we want to like learn a macro control, which is like, you know, well, that's what, that's what Philip did with the hand pretty much. So like I think like some synthesizers they have like this macro control feature that you, you can use in like presets 
you know, they're they're very useful because you know they can you can give like really good motions to the sounds, and you know you don't have to tweak all the parameters. Mm -hmm. But but you know like and also but okay so these macro controls they have like you know some labels like hissy or like loud or noisy or something, and also and so. We want to like get these sort of macro control, like by machine learning. So you know th this this provides like a very good interface, a much better interface than parameters, at least. So what we use as a macro control is the exactly the latent space of the variation of the encoder. So like as we as we explained earlier, like. Uh, the latent space of the variation of the encoder is like kind of uh, pretty neatly organized. So, this tra traveling between, uh, like traveling inside the latent space is like a uh, pretty good control, a pretty good way to control the synthesizer, at least. And also, like, so some presets have these semantic tags, tag information that we we can use to make the latent space more organized, pretty much. And so that pretty much that, that brings us like a, a softness knob or like loudness knob or like dynamic knob or something like that. You know, you can you can turn this knob to make the sound more loud or fat. <coughs> yeah, so this is what we use to make the latent space like a bit more organized. But yeah, like it's that's also normal I think flow as well. And also, we have like preset neighborhood exploration. Oh, we explained this as well. Like, uh, so we learned like a map, invertible mapping between the, the parameters and the latent space. So, just have this like invertible mapping, right? So we have we can like get the parameters and then get the z from that parameter, which is useful because like you can see like how how like each preset is like uh, distributed in the latent space. So well, like, I'm, I'm just going to get into like the, the greedy part of the research. Uh, we use like two, two of these VSP synthesizers. Uh, this one is uh, Diva that we showed earlier. Uh, does anybody use Diva? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know it's like not the most popular, but like this one we could use because the presets we could actually parse because like massive, I tried looking into it, it's like encrypted or something. <laughs> and yeah, and also like the presets have like this semantic information like that comes with it. It's like, it's like it says if each preset is like dynamic or dark or something. Which, is, which was very useful as well. And also I use this DEX, which is like a, uh, it's an FM synthesizer and it's like a perfect clone of uh, DX7. <clears throat> and also we need to get the data set, like, you know, just we, we need the sounds and the parameters like corresponding. So we, we gather presets from like the internet and like, you know, so and we just parse the presets and then automatically play them, which sounds easy, but actually it wasn't. <laughs> and so yeah, like it's like some numbers, I mean, I'm not interested in numbers, right? But you know, like, so we just wanted to say that, you know, like this, using the operational autoencoder pretty much uh, helped in like, you know, like, you know, reconstructing the parameters of our audio. Yeah, so yeah, let's, and those, yes, okay. Yeah, this is like, well, I mean, like, I think we showed enough, like, results, like, in the last, <laughs> the last five minutes of the presentation, but, like, you know, we can, like, create recreate audio like really wow, nice. Wow, wow. Okay and, well, 
and this is uh, about uh, semantic mapping control, which you know like uses tags to like organize the latent space, and it works sometimes. And like you know, in this, in this case, it's working like you know constant and moving, you know, uh, constant. You know, I mean, if you look at the spectrograms, then yes, like there's a lot of motion going forward. And I will talk about the uh, FM synthesis stuff. So well, I don't know if anyone uses DX7 because it's a very old synthesizer. <laughs> but uh, the problem is that DX7 has like some FM matrices, which is like uh, it completely changed the signal flow, and you know it's very, very weird. So we need to get this parameter as like a separate condition, <laughs> and. Well, yeah, so we just add the condition to like the mapping. As we just condition the mapping of the parameter and the fading space. Much and yeah, and this is like some results here. So like the first one was the original and the second one is the reconstruction. It's like kind of similar, right? Yeah, it has like you know like the right partials and the the regional is a bit noisier, but it's, it's like it gets the point. This is the original. So like there's a lot of like complex timbre, so it doesn't quite perfectly do it, but you know the the envelope of the audio is like pretty much okay. And now show some interpolation, like you know, there's two between like two latent space la latent variables. Okay. So like uh, oh. so we just want to like like fade between like these two sounds, okay? It's pretty smooth, right? And, uh, <laughs> okay, it's pretty smooth, and you know it doesn't. It, sh it shouldn't work this well, like if you like actually like just added the two parameters and like interpolated between them, because like <coughs> there's a lot of like uh, very well, if you, yeah. <laughs> it, it it goes smooth because we use the latent space of the variational auto encoder. And uh, that's pretty much it for my sorry. Okay, so well, yes, that's pretty much it for my uh, presentation. Uh, yes, uh, the problem is with like this current research is that you know like only some synthesizer we can use because like uh, well, there's not enough presets and also some. There's not enough presets that we can actually <coughs> use because of like actual technical difficulties regarding the preset like specifications and you know, like VST speed specification. I don't I don't know if like some of, maybe some of you have like tinkered around with like making VSTs or not, but it's really weird and then there's like no uniform, like unified like way to handle presets, which is a shame, but Okay, but yes. Do you, have, do you guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, can you go back to the slides? The number says no one wants to know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, is any of those the one that is LSP and base that you mentioned? Oh, that, that is a very good question because. Uh, 
actually no. No, okay. <laughs> and also, yeah, I, I'm glad you asked this, but uh, so like the previous research, they use like a different uh, representation of audio. Mm -hmm. Well, they use like MFCCs, uh, no, because you get some good coefficients and it's like, well, you couldn't use it for like our model, so we couldn't really compare it, but like, you know, in general, you know, like, so we have these three models here that don't use recuperation autoencoders or autoencoders, mm -hmm. and they they did not perform like they, they, they performed worse than like the models that all use recuperation autoencoders. So I, I think that pretty much uh, at least you know gives uh, some proof that using recuperation autoencoders and like you know using the latent variables. To map between the parameters is like effective. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you add just that you can actually do anything with the encoders in the video. Mm -hmm. so basically, you can use your own encoders and you can use the encoder. So, right now, I think these lines are like in CNN, like the basic CNN. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's like the AE, the AE, the AE. Oh, yeah, yeah, those are yeah. the CNN. Oh, yeah, it's CNN. Oh, yeah, CNN. Oh, yeah, CNN. So actually, the fact that it's getting a better score in terms of the CNN, I mean, a way better score, means that if it has them, it does work, then I think it should not be really bad. But, 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 but why you, 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 you didn't use an um, MFCC to your uh, approach? Well, I should. <laughs> mm, uh, well, most spectrogram worked better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe MFCC is too, too um, very, uh, uh, yeah, very so the MFCCs are like very compact and like good, but uh, well, we like, we actually could like use the null spectrogram and like not worry so much about the computation cost, and it just did better. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like could it could maybe a lot better than that. Yeah, actually, I think MFCCs. Like it just gives you like temporal manipulation across different you know, events. So regarding the fine structure, this is if you try network. But in this case, we are mostly interested in two sounds that pertains to a specific timbre, but not so much temporal information. So if you take something as speech, for instance, or complex music, then MFCC is super cool because it's kind of very efficient way. But if you look at like fine temporal uh, structure. Then you lose too much information mm -hmm. by doing MFCCs. So actually, our results were we, we did use MFCC, but the results were just the same as this with higher scores. Mm -hmm. and so the ratio between the people and the autoencoding approach is the same. Like even if you use MFCC, the VA still is way better. Mm -hmm. But it was the same numbers like multiplied by two or something. So mm -hmm. we thought it's useless to put like uh, mm -hmm. also MFCC in the paper. Mm -hmm. So it was just laziness. Yeah, okay. Oh, ah, this entanglement. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and how do you how do you what? Ah, not the quality of the point. So, yeah, I mean, after finding the latency space, yeah, this may be quite difficult to now. Like, I'm having to find that. Wait, I'm sorry? I think the question is how do you perform conditioning and the same thing at the same time? Ah, well, like, yeah. Okay, uh, I did not. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a different experiment, so it's not, yeah, but like it's totally possible. I mean, it's just, uh, just so like the whole VAE is not conditioned actually, it's just uh, nothing between the synthesizer, like the latent space of audio and the mapping. And yeah, it just, uh, just concatenate the uh, categorical parameters to just do conditioning. Yeah, that the theory can be uh, like instrument, uh, that the instrument should be the real instrument. Real instruments? I mean, like the 
it's just you can edit the feature so that the uh, it doesn't represent uh, uh, the real instruments, but uh, kind of like a concurrent feature for the like, like idea of uh, virtual. Uh, virtual uh, thing. Yeah, I think yeah, so we just do this because uh, this uh, categorical branch is like, kind of hard to deal with using normalizing clothes. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I can get it. I mean, like, if you, I mean, please, like, ask me, like, later. I, I mean, there will be a break after the next presentation, so also more, more chance to you also get Everyone, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me such an opportunity uh, to share my presentation. I'm Saki Tanihara from Tokyo University of the Art, and my presentation theme is AI composition and physicality from virtual composer finger to music robots all over the world. We think uh, AI is uh, the brain replaced a human brain for artificial brain but uh, intelligence uh, is uh, related with the uh, body i think and the something so and for the moment uh, more than 90 percent of uh, ai composer um, uh, don't have a brain function, a uh, body function. However, recently, uh, the research has developed, uh, such as embodied AI composer. And uh, before talking about uh, embodied AI composer, I, I show some example. Uh, as you know, uh, we have several uh, AI composition systems. For example, big companies uh, such as Sony or Google created uh, Magenta or Flow Machines. And uh, famous university such as University of Tokyo or Osaka University also uh, created the system. And uh, Brain Melody, the last one, is uh, interesting. Uh, yes, um, where headset and uh, major brain wave and uh, AI compose uh, music, what we want to have. So this Brain Melody 
uh, has a little bit physicality, but I I don't uh, classify uh, this as a embodied AI composer. Yes, embodied AI composer uh, has artificial brain and body. Uh, two type of body: artificial body and human body. And uh, I include the intangible body as well. Um, for example, artificial body uh, is a musical robot, and uh, with intangible artificial body, we have virtual composer singer. And uh, with human body, we have cyborg composer. And uh, I class I divided into three types of embodied AI composer. Uh, first is uh, AI composition and tangible artificial body. And second is AI and intangible artificial body. And third one is AI and human body, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, Okay, let's move on to the first group, AI and tangible artificial body. And before I talk about that, uh, let me give you some examples of history of musical robots uh, all over the world. Uh, before Christ era, we already had uh, the idea of robot and uh, in uh, between 12th century uh, and uh, 19th century, uh, we have musical automaton. This is a self-operating -oper machine. And uh, uh, this was very popular in Europe, but 12th, in the 12th century, uh, Muslim, Muslim engineer Al Jazari uh, invented a musical robot uh, band. This is considered as the world's first programmable robot. And uh, yes, uh, 18th century, uh, Pierre Jacquet was a Swiss watchmaker created as a musician. This is automaton, uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that uh, in this era, uh, watch maker created automaton and music boxes. So uh, the, in the interesting thing is that uh, watch and robot and uh, music boxes are originally and historically uh, associated together. Uh, this is I think this is interesting. And uh, uh, the name of the robot uh, appeared in 1920, uh, coined by Czech writer. And after that, uh, in 2007, a uh, German engineer created a robot band called the Compressor Head. This robot uh, can uh, play the instruments. And later, in 2015, Mion starts on Berlin Opera Stage. Uh, Mion, this, uh, that is the Mion. Yes, and to the two years later, you need Swiss robot conductor. Conductor makes opera debut. That one is the conductor robot. So this is a brief explanation about the robot in the world. And let's take a look at Japanese robot. Mm. Uh, 
between 12th century and 19th century, Karakuri puppet were created. This is the uh, uh, Edo period. And, uh, and uh, the first robot in Japan is Gakuten Soku, uh, was created in 1928 uh, in Osaka. And after that, in 1984, uh, Wabot 2 was created in by Waseda University. Uh, this robot can play the electric organ with, with two hands and two legs. And uh, uh, they can see the scores with his eyes and they can recognize a uh, singing human voice and after that in 2005 iDog was created by Sega Toys Corporation this robot can compose uh, not AI powered but they can compose, yes, and uh, the same at the same year, Toyota, uh, one of the biggest more, more car manufacturer companies, uh, created a Toyota partner robot. Uh, these robots can play instruments like a trumpet or a drums and violin as well and after that uh, that machine uh, that robot as uh, those robots are created robot band were created and finally last year Android uh, Android Conductor Outer 3 uh, successfully conduct human orchestra this Android this is AI powered Android and uh, created by uh, the most famous Android make maker Professor Ishiguro and four days ago, Kunitachi uh, Music College and uh, Tokyo, the University of Tokyo announced that they, they will start joint, uh, joint project to research the conductor and Android conductor and human orchestra relationship and uh, next so let's get down to the specifics uh, this robot female looking robot called called mean uh, she can dance and and sing and equipped with Vocaloid, Yamaha Vocaloid and Voca Watcher. This is a facial motion generator. So she can sing with facial motion.
So now, uh, humanoid uh, can now uh, So now we know that a robot can uh, play the instruments and uh, conduct the orchestra, human orchestra, and uh, also dance and uh, sing with special movement and body movement. And uh, but the most suitable example is Simon. The robotic marine player, uh, he can compose. Yes, it's created by Bill Weinberg and AI powered robot. And uh, he could, uh, he can, uh, he created robot percussionist in 2006. And this was the world's first improvising robot. Let's And Jill Weinberg uh, received several prizes of Aus Electronica. artificial body. Uh, voice is very important uh, thing uh, when we think uh, with Kaiji. So, uh, mm. yes. okay. In 2003, Vocaloid was created by Yamaha. And uh, Yamaha uh, gave uh, physicality to vo the voice for character vocal series appeared, uh, like Hatsune Miku, as you know. And uh, in 2015, AI Rina uh, was created, and Rina became a singer last year. Uh, AI Rina, uh, so. She learned so many data of human breath, so very natural and natural voice. So, so let's listen to a little bit. After the Apex, one of the biggest uh, music companies. Mm -hmm. 
And then last year, uh, maybe you you watched the Hibari AI Hibari uh, in the Kohaku Dagasen. AI Hibari uh, used uh, uses uh, Vocaloid AI, this is a more evolution, evolution Vocaloid, and with 4K 3D program, um, she sang for Kohaku Utagasen. Yes. And uh, three years ago, uh, Yamaha and Line Corporation announced that uh, they started to develop new products and service, Composer Singer. This is a, this has an enormous possibility to to make progress uh, embodied intelligence and AI in composition. And the last one is AI and human body. Uh, Amazon Web Service uh, created a keyboard, machine learning keyboard. Yeah. Yes. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, and this is the world's first machine learning enabled keyboard. So, if you are interested in, please check out this. And uh, yeah, our, our Tokyo University of the Arts uh, created the dance recognition system with the piano playing the piano. So the dancer, famous dancer, uh, attaches the sensor, and this sensor, this sensor, uh, four types of sensor, uh, uh, translated into the MIDI data, and the player piano Yamaha describes it, performs with the musical data. So, Thank you. Is motions and 